All right, well, today we'll begin continuing on in chapter 2, talking about God's moral attributes. And the moral attributes of God are not contradictory, but they all work in harmony. As we talk about God's moral nature, love, light, holiness, mercy, gentleness, righteousness, goodness, perfection, justice, faithfulness, truth, and grace. All these are part of God's moral nature. Uh, I do believe, and I think I made this statement the last time, that you know, when God put a man and a woman together, he gave all those moral attributes into that uh, union because men think one way and women think another, and God created us in his what? Own image. So all those attributes are usually uh, collectively in a uh, uh, union between a man and a woman. For example, God's holiness required an immediate separation from God, between God and humans, when they sin. And when you read throughout the Word of God, you understand that God and sin cannot touch. You can get as close as possible, but cannot touch. So in order for God to feel the sins of humanity, He had to take on what? Human form. And because He took on human form, God's presence or spirit does not touch sin, but that human form felt the weight of sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because he was God incarnate in flesh, but he had that dual nature. He was 100% human, where he was 100% God. The death of the innocent, sinless Christ, and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us to satisfy God's justice and holiness. If, however, we reject Christ's atonement, then we are left to face God's judgment alone. The Bible says some men's sins are sent before them, and some men's sins follow them. What does that mean? It means simply this, that those who have repented, been baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and living a holy life, and have a repented heart, because repentance is not a one-time thing, but it is a daily thing. You should be talking to God and asking God to forgive you for the things you have done and have a repentant heart. Then what are you doing? You are sending those sins on before you. There, Those sins are all what? Already judged. But those who have not got a repentant heart, who have not been baptized in Jesus' name, have not been uh, filled with His Spirit and trying to live a godly life, it's those people whose sins follow them. And when we stand before God, it's not that he looks and sees a man or a woman or, or a child or whatever. What he looks for is what? To see if there is sin there. And yes, I know children are sanctified by the parents, and I understand what that means. It doesn't mean they don't sin, but you ever notice a child that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven? When, when you worship God, what do they do? They throw their little hands up in the air and they worship God. They're sanctified by your actions. When you pray, they get down and pray. I, you know, until they become to an age of understanding and are answerable to their own, they follow their parents or they follow their brothers and sisters, whatever it is, and that's where that sanctification comes in. Uh, holiness demands a separation from sinful human nature. And his, just, and, and his justice demands death for sinful humans. That's why it says in, in the Revelation, we shall be judged. But also before that, it talks about the fact that the church goes home to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He comes and calls us, which is referring to the rapture. Those are the blood brought. Those are the ones who have prepared themselves to be with the Lord. Those are the ones who have repented of their sins are not bound by their sins. And if we reject God's love and holiness and mercy, then if we don't accept it, then we will face judgment. Now, another uh, attribute of God is theophanies. A theophany is a visible manifestation of God, and we usually think of it in a temporary nature. God does not stay that way. We know that he came down and showed himself to who? Moses. 
as what? A burning bush. Does that mean God's a burning bush? No. Uh, he came down and he showed himself to Abraham. And he showed himself, and it's referred to as an angel. Does that mean God is an angel or a man? But no. When he came before Joshua, he was what? The captain of the Lord's host. And Joshua recognized who he was. But he is always the captain of the Lord's host, but he did not manifest himself ever again as the captain of the Lord's host. It was not until he finally enrolled himself in human flesh where he revealed himself to man in the form of Jesus Christ. Uh, and in, uh, with Jacob, he was what? He came in the form of a man and he wrestled with an angel and he looked God in the face is what it says. And he did not die. But we know that that was a manifestation of God. We also know that when Moses wanted to see his face, what did he do? He said, no, no. He said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. And he said, I'll pass by and you can see my hinder parts for no one can see my face and live. So the only face that, that we will see is the face of Jesus Christ. We know that that is the face of God or, or the entombment or body of God. Uh, God manifested himself in thunder, lightning, fire, clouds, smoke, all these different things, earthquake, all these different things. Does that mean God is limited to exposing himself in this nature? No, he is not. Uh, Job saw him in a whirlwind. Various prophets saw visions of God. Uh, Daniel saw the form of a man in where? He was with the three Hebrew children in the fire and he had the form of God or the son of man. He is referred to as the ancient of days. He was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Yeah, he came at night to Balaam and met Balaam on two other occasions. All these things, but God is not restrained to this one appearance. I mean, we notice that in each one of these appearances, it was only temporal. Well, you say, well, God revealed himself in that cloud and pillar of fire for he led the children of Israel for over 40 years in the wilderness. That wasn't a temporary. It still was a temporary thing when you look in the, in the overall existence of time. 40 years is not even a drop in the bucket when we think about the existence of time. And it was only for a set time that he revealed himself in that manner. And it was for a set purpose. And we know that that was so that he could lead them into the promised land. Uh, so we see that a theophany is only a temporary, uh, to serve, a temporary manifestation to serve a specific purpose. Uh, we know that in each of the one of them, when Moses, it was the burning bush, it was to get him to go lead the children of Israel. As the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, it was to lead them. And we know that Joshua is to encourage him so that he knew he was doing the right thing by going against Jericho and into the promised land. All these things God did was to use it to prove to people and we ever notice that in our day, that today, that we don't see that kind of proving? We don't see those visible manifestations of God because he has visibly manifestation to himself to the church in that we, what, feel his spirit. We know there's a God because we sense his spirit all around us, in us, and through us, right? Yeah. And so we, we do have that manifestation, but it is the Spirit of God. Even though we haven't seen Him, we love Him, we believe in Him, we follow Him. And saying that, we also know that because of that, we can trust Him. Mm -hmm. And I have heard this statement, and I have found it to be true. Visions are at home. Burdens are at home. Confirmation comes from afar. In other words, 
when God shows you something and, and, and you know that you need to do it and everything else, uh, you will, if you want it, you will get a confirmation. But it's going to come from somebody that's a long ways away from you who knows nothing about your situation. My wife and I were uh, coming to this country, and, and just to give you an example, and we were driving the car because we had something that had happened. There was a roadblock put in, in place, and the, we were driving along the car, and we were about halfway between our home in, in uh, Ontario and, and my dad's home in New Brunswick, which was about 500 miles, because my dad lives a 1,000 miles away from where I lived in St. Catharines. And we were about halfway to my dad's house, and we were talking. And I made three specific statements in the car. Now that's just my wife and I in the car. And about five minutes afterwards, there was a phone call. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say who it was, it was Sister Marvin Walker from Michigan. And she begins talking to my wife and she said, the Lord has showed me, she said, and this was, uh, she said, I'm normally in church today, but I'm feeling sick and, and I know she had some health issues. So she said, I'm, I'm basically laying here in bed, but the Lord began talking to me and, and I called Sister Kelly and Sister Kelly said, you need to call the Beaks. And so she said, I am calling you. And she began to talk to my wife and those very three statements that I have made, she addressed each one of them perfectly. Confirmation comes from afar. She knew nothing of what we were saying. We were in a car probably almost a thousand miles from her home and she called. And if you don't know that's the hand of God, then boys, you need to wake up. And we knew, we knew it was God. We were excited and, and she told us this is what the Lord had shown her, but this is also uh, what the Lord was going to do. So we, we don't see theophanies today, but God uses people to speak into our lives. And so if you get a burden, you say, Lord, I, I really feel I need to go to someone's place, then you're going to get a confirmation from somebody. But also you're going to get a confirmation from your pastor and everything else. We had all those things. And so that's, that's the way God reveals himself to us in the church today. Uh, Sometimes another manifestation of God is the angel of the Lord. And this seems to be uh, like a theophany. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar, spoke as though he were God, and was called God by her. Again, in the burning bush, uh, the angel, all these visitations of the angel of the Lord do not indicate whether they were manifestations of God himself or not, although frequently people assume that they were. And sometimes they are angels that are dispatched by God and they are known as messenger angels. And so God sends them forth for a specific time and a person or a purpose which is to deliver a message. And uh, you could call Sister Marvin Walker and say she was an angel because she delivered a specific message to my wife and I. And, uh, but we believe in, in the fact that God uses people to confirm his word. In analyzing all these verses of Scripture, some say that the angel of the Lord always is a direct manifestation of God. However, some of the instances mentioned above do not support this view, and two of them actually contradict it. Others say the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of God in some instances and not in others. And it seems to be the one that's consistent with the Scriptures. It is evident that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is not always God himself. A person can possibly argue that the angel of the Lord was never an actual theophany, but he cannot seriously contend that the angel of the Lord was always a theophany. theophany. The simple thing is that the phrase angel of the Lord sometimes refers to a theophany of God, but other times denotes nothing more than an ordinary angel. Now, in saying that, when you read revelations and it says right unto the angel of the church of Sardis or the, right unto the angel of the church of Laodicea what's that angel referring to? It's a, the, the messenger within the church which the, is the, the leader like the pastor yeah that's what it's referring to so there's a terminology where angel is used which is in reflection of actually talking about the pastor so you see, you've got to be careful when you read the word angel. It's not talking about what we think is these angelic beings that are manifested. So 
I just brought that in there as an extra. Now, uh, some, even when it comes down to Melchizedek, refer to him as a theophany. And we know that Melchizedek is only mentioned a couple of times in, in Scripture. And Hebrews 7, 3 says he was without father, mother, and descent. That he was in, this could mean that he was in God in human form, or it could mean simply that his genealogical origin was not recorded. Uh, Hebrews 7, 4 does call him a man, and in regards to what one considers to be an ordinary man or a theology of God in the form of man, he was a type of a foreshadowing of Christ. And we know that because it says that Jesus Christ was after the order of Melchizedek, referring to the high priest or the priesthood of God. Another theophany, and we already mentioned this one, is the fourth man who appeared in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It appears that the phrase sons of God can refer to angelic beings. And we know that is true because why? Why do we know they, that the angelic beings can be referred to sons of God? Why? Why do you think? Why the angels can be referred to as sons of God? Yeah, why can they be referred to as sons of God? Uh, do they have human form? It sounds really like um, out there, but I don't know. It could be right. Yeah. Is it because um, um, Jesus, like obviously in, in God's foreknowledge, he already existed, the manifestation of Jesus Christ. And so. Um, that same God was all manifested as an angel in the Old Testament. So it's kind of like, yeah. and other things. Okay. How about simply this? They're created beings by God. Okay. Everything that's created by that's God, manifested. including ourselves, and when he refers to the sons of God, does he refer just to man, or does he refer to the sons of God being man and woman? Okay. You see what I mean? Because it's created by God. So that's why sometimes when it says uh, the sons of God, it can refer to angelic beings. But in other times, it does not refer to angelic beings. And I'm going to throw a wrench into some people's theology. Because a lot of people, which refers, when it refers to the sons of God, talk about the, how they had relationship with man uh, for yeah. women and they created giant. That can't be true. Why not? Angels don't reproduce. Exactly, they do not reproduce. There's only two that can create, and one can only procreate because God allows it. God creates, we as humans procreate. Do you understand? Yeah. And so that's why angels, nowhere in the Bible can you show me that angels have a reproduction system. If you do, then I'll believe that way of teaching. Until then, I don't believe it one bit. Sorry. That's me. For anybody that's watching this, you, you give me definite proof that angels can procreate, and I'll believe you. Anyways, uh, there are no New Testament... Uh, theophanies because why? God revealed himself in the body and form of Jesus Christ. That is the last temporal body that we will ever know because we know that when we re read Revelations and he comes back in the clouds the same way that he left, he comes back how? As the same as he left and in the body of Jesus Christ. When he revealed himself to the disciples, he did it where? As Jesus Christ. They saw him. They knew him. They, they touched the nail prints in his hand. They, they thrust their, their hands into his side. They knew he was flesh. And you ever notice that it says flesh and bones? It does not say anything about blood because his blood was shed at where? At Calvary. And so it's the spirit that gives him life. And if you re remember what Revelation told him, it's the fact that there's going to be his spirit that's going to be giving this body life. It will not be the blood anymore. Because what the Bible says, the life is in the blood. And life is in Jesus Christ, in God. All right, we're going to look at some of the names and titles of God. This is one of the 
uh, biggest issues in, in, in differentiating what is a name and what is a title. And, we, and this is one of the biggest questions that's asked because we all know that it's disputed about when people are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Because those three are titles that is not a name. And so we're going to look into that. The uh, Bible says in Acts 4 and 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For it's at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is both Lord and Christ. Uh, names in the Bible times, especially in Old Testament time, carry much more significance than it does today. And I have made this statement before because uh, I know people look at Chronicles and say, wow, I'm not going to read all those names because it's kind of boring. But I'm just wondering if somebody who ever gets the time to, including myself, to sit down and go through each one of those names and find out what they mean. Because a lot of the times when the children of Israel had a child, they named it for a specific th reason because uh, of a situation in their life or, or what, the, what they were going to felt that God would, was going to do in their life. So like the name of Moses was given f for a purpose. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it was changed from Jacob, who was a supplanter, to Israel, which was a prince of God. It was changed for a specific reason. And so we know that those, those names are given for that. So I, it's kind of curious as to what Chronicles is all about in, in explaining those names. Uh, it's all, uh, sometimes God changed the name of a person for a specific reason. And we know that because na the name of Abram, because that was his name, Abram, A-B-R-A-M, which means exalted father. But he changed it to Abraham, which was the father of multitudes, just by adding that one little bit. The same thing like we said, we, the name of Jacob, which means heel catcher or supplanter. To Israel, he will rule with God or rule as God. Now also, Simon, because we know his, we all say, oh, we, we love the apostle Peter, but that was not his name. That was his surname. Simon was his first name. And Simon means hearing. And so he took Simon and changed it to what? Peter, which means a rock. Okay. And so we see that uh, how God uh, allowed for their names to be changed so that it could suit the purpose. Now we know that Peter denied the Lord. Doesn't seem like much of a rock, does it? We know that he was bullheaded. He was like a, uh, as we would say in Canada, we, he was like a bull in a china shop. He went in there and he just, he'd like to go in and he'd just smash things, take things over and, and deal with things and boom. But we know that when he was saved, because Jesus told him, he said, Satan has desired to sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that when thou art converted, he will strengthen. You know, so it was talking about the time when Peter was going to have a conversion. And it was when Peter had that conversion, we read in the Word of God, you notice that there's a big change in Peter. And we see that this is where the rock comes into place. He's the one that's not afraid to stand up because he's that bull in the china shop and be declared on, on the day of Pentecost. He is not the one, he's not afraid to, to declare Jesus Christ and who he is throughout. He's whipped, he's put in jail, he's, he's not afraid because he became a rock. Uh, God uses names as a means of progressive self-revelation. That is the one thing I do know that when you look throughout the Word of God, from start to finish, and I'm talking about the Old Testament especially, from start to finish, you notice that he said to Moses, he said, I am that I am. But then later on he said, I'm Jehovah, or Y-H-W-H. 
later on he says, I'm jealous, I'm the branch, I'm this, I'm that. So it's almost a progressive revealing of himself to the children of Israel until he finally revealed himself in the man Christ, Jesus, when he revealed his name fully there. By, uh, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob by the name God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. This is Exodus 6 and 3. God promised to reveal himself to his people in a new way, that is, he began to associate his name with a new understanding of his character and attributes. That's what he was doing. And throughout the Old Testament, we will read different places where he revealed himself little by little. And we're going to go into some of that in a few moments. In addition to using names to manifest his character, God used his name to manifest his presence. We notice that at the temple when Solomon acknowledged God was omnipresent. God f fills the universe. Solomon asks how the temple, a man-made structure, could contain God. My name shall be there, 1 Kings 8 and 29. Solomon went on to pray that all the people of the earth may know thy name, 1 Kings 8 and 43. Once again, the statement links the name of God with a revelation of his character. The name of God represents his authority as well as his power. I, I've, uh, I've noticed in my prayer life that I've been asking God to speak. Because when God speaks, that's it. It's going to be done. Nothing will stop it. Because God is the authority in this world. When he speaks, devils tremble. When he speaks, walls are torn down. When he speaks, people are drawn to him. He, when he speaks into this nation, he will change the very face of this nation. And I know he's already speaking through the cross into this nation, but there's something about when the voice of God is heard. It makes a difference. Uh, God's name represents the following. God's presence the revelation of his character, his power, and his authority. Here we do that again. God's presence, the revelation of his character, his power, and his authority. That's what God's name represents. God demands fear, and that word fear does not mean, ooh, I'm shaking in my boots, but it means reverence and respect for his name. Deuteronomy 28, 58, and 59. He commands his people not to take his name in vain. Exodus 20 and 7. God warns his people not to forget his name. Psalms 44, 20 and 21. And Jeremiah 23, 25 and 27. And God promises a blessing for those who know his name. Psalms 91, 14 through 16. There is a blessing for those who think upon his name, Malachi 3 and 16. So we know that when we think about God or we think about that name that is so precious, these are the things. We don't say the name of Jesus in disrespect. We call out the name of Jesus in reverence. We hold it so sweetly to our lives. Now, I remember a time when I was out in the world, I didn't treat it with respect. But now, every time somebody swears, I just go, I cringe inside. I say, oh, God. But that, if you only knew him, that is the sweetest name you have ever said. One thing about a child of God, and you know the mercies of God, and you fall in love with him, you never forget him. You can forget a lot of things, but I don't think you'll ever forget the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we do know that God pours out a blessing to those who know his name and uh, believe in him and think upon his name. And we know that because the church, we see that in the church at all times. All right, so we're going to look at a few uh, Old Testament names for God. Now, uh, one of the hardest 
languages to translate the scriptures into has been the English language. It's, it's an own statement. I, I love uh, working with people of other cultures because when I do, I ask them to get their Bible and I begin to ask them questions and concerning the scriptures and I want them to read it in their Bible so that and then translate what it says in their Bible into English for me. <clears throat> I've done this several times because I have found that uh, even a Spanish Bible or or a, a Filipino Bible or a Gehenning Bible and a French Bible, those are the four that I have dealt with so far. I don't know if Sister Luzu has a Nigerian Bible, I'll have to ask her and get her to do the same thing. But I always ask them, I want you to translate directly out of there and say what it says in your Bible, not what it says in the King James Bible. And when I've done it, I've noticed that there's a big, not difference, but there's a big punch to it. In other words, the, the other Bibles have more emphasis on what I believe than the English Bible. Uh, I think it's in the French Bible or the, or the Gehenna Bible. And when it says Acts 2.38, it says, repent and be baptized. It doesn't say that in their Bible. It says, repent and you have to be baptized. Okay. <laughs> so, so it puts more emphasis on what we teach and believe. So uh, in saying that, let's look at uh, the difference. Now, one, two, three, four, five. There are five different names for the word God. Elohim in, in, in uh, Hebrew, in English, means God in Genesis 1 and 1. El, which is Genesis 14 and 18, still refers to God. Eloha, which is uh, Nehemiah 9 and 17, also is God. Elah, Daniel 2 and 18, is the Aramaic form of the word God. Uh, Genesis 15 and 2, Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, again. Lord, or Y-H-W-H, or Y-H, Genesis 2 and 4. These are the meaning. Jehovah, again, is Y-H-W-H in Hebrew. Jah, or Y-H, or Yah, Y-A-H, Psalms 68 and 4. Lord, which is Adon, Joshua 3.11, or Lord, which is Adonai, Genesis 15 and 2. Uh, I am that I am, Eiah, Asher, Eiah, Exodus 3, 14. I am, Eiah, Most High God, El, Elam, Genesis 14 and 18. The God of Sight, Elroy, Genesis 16 and 13. Almighty God, El Shaddai, Genesis 17 and 1. We all no thou. Everlasting God, El Olam, Genesis 21 and 33. Now you notice that throughout there, E-L is used many times, and it actually means strength, mighty, almighty, or by extension, deity. Uh, Eloa always refers to deity, E-L-A-H is the Aramaic or Chaldean form of Eloah. And Elohim is the plural form of Eloah. And the Old Testament used this word more than any other to mean God. And in this case, the Hebrew plural is an intensive from denoting the greatness, majesty, and multiple attributes of God. Not meaning he's a plural God. Adon, or A-D-O-N, means ruler, master, or lord, whether human, angelic, or divine. And Adonai is the emphatic form of Adon and specifically refers to the Lord God. Yahweh, or Jehovah, is the redemptive name of God in the Old Testament because we know Jehovah 